Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. So this is going to set Titus apart from the people described at the end of Titus chapter 1. They may teach legalism and fables, but Titus was to teach the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The idea behind this phrase has to do with right living, not just right thinking. The Living Bible translates this, speak up for the right living that goes along with true Christianity. The New Living Translation has promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. We cannot escape it. The Bible is a book that tells us how to live. It is the height of, hip- of hypocrisy to say that we believe it's truth if we ignore how it tells us to live our lives. We don't always like it. It's in our nature. But we always need to hear how God expects us to live. And Paul simply wants Titus to fulfill the command of Jesus in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where he says, Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Verse 2, That the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. And so Titus had some older men among the Christians in Crete. They had to be approached with love and wisdom, or they might easily be offended when taught by a younger man like Titus. And Paul wanted Titus to know that they must live with the maturity and wisdom that their years should give them. This means sober, reverent, and temperate lives. The command to teach these things means that they don't come automatically with age. And they must also have stability, being stable in the right things, sound in faith, love, and patience. As we get older, we tend to harden in our ways. This is a good thing if we harden in the ways of faith, love, and patience. Uh, Patience is the ancient Greek word hupomone. It means a steadfast and active endurance, not a passive waiting. Older men are not just to patiently wait around until they pass on to the next world. They are to actively endure the challenges of life, even the challenges of old age. Verse 3 and 4. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women. So just as Titus had to give special consideration to the older men, also must he keep in mind how to approach the older woman. They have their own set of temptations and opportunities. The idea behind behavior suggests, uh, includes a suggestion of dress and how a woman carries herself. The word for slanderers is the same word used for devils. When the older women, or anyone else for that matter, slander and gossip, then they're doing the devil's work. The adjective reverent basically means suitable to a sacred office, and it's going to convey the image of a good priestess carrying out the duties of her office. The conduct of the older women must reveal that they regard life as sacred in all of its aspects. Not given to too much wine was a common failing of older women in the Roman and Greek culture, and perhaps also our own. Paul recognizes that this special challenge needs special instruction. The two prohibitions which follow, not false accusers and not given to too much wine, again vividly portray the contemporary Cretan environment. The first was already been met in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, which says, Likewise, their wives, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. And the second is in Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy for money. So evidently, in Crete, the liability to these excesses was more severe than in Ephesus especially among the women, for the verb dulo used here signifies bondage or slaves to drink, a much stronger expression than the corresponding phrase in 1 Timothy. So teachers of good things. If the older women have special challenges, they also have special opportunities. God can use their wisdom and experience as they admonish the young women. This gives the older women something positive to live towards instead of the negative things of slander and alcohol abuse. So teachers of good things, verse 4 and 5. The young women, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. 
And so according to Paul's instruction, Titus was not to make his ministry to teach the young women directly. Instead, he was to equip and encourage the older women to teach the young women. And of course, this doesn't mean that the young women were barred from listening to Titus teach. It simply means that it was wrong and dangerous for Titus to make the young women a focus of his ministry. If there was a young women Bible study group, Titus shouldn't teach it. The older women should. And so instruction for the young women begins with home matters. God has given them a strategic position of influence and assistance to their husbands and their children, and they must let love dominate their influence and assistance. Paul says that love for husbands and children must be taught. Certainly aspects of this love are inborn, but other aspects, especially aspects that reflect the self-giving sacrifice of Jesus, must be taught. And so the young women must be taught these attitudes, discreet and chaste, and skills, homemakers. Goodness isn't always easy in a world that blurs the line between good and evil. So the older women need to teach the younger to be good. Obedient to their own husbands is another way of expressing the wife's duty to submission in the marriage relationship. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 will say, Wives, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And so that the word of God may not be blasphemed. This shows how important it is for the older women to teach these things and for the younger women to learn them. When Christians don't live in a biblical godly manner, it means that the word of God may be blasphemed among the ungodly. Verse 6, likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded. So this is a linking word, likewise. It shows that the young men need to learn isn't all that different from what the younger women, the older women, and the older men need to learn. We may need a slightly different emphasis depending on our station in life, but the essential message of godly living is the same. And so to be sober-minded... The Living Bible will translate the thought behind this very well, urge the young men to behave carefully, taking life seriously. This is the only command Titus is told to emphasize to young men, but sometimes a difficult, a very difficult one for younger men. Sober-minded, the word is sophron, and it describes the man with a mind which has everything under control. Strength of mind which has learned to govern every instinct and passion until each has its proper place and no more. Verse 7 and 8. In all things showing yourselves to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to say of you. So Titus had to be more than just a teacher. He also had to be an example. His guidance to others could not be taken seriously if he himself was not walking after the Lord. And Titus had to be an example in doctrinal stability and integrity. If he wasn't comfortably settled in his understanding of the scriptures, he wasn't ready to lead. And so that that one who is an opponent may be ashamed and so that your accusers will be embarrassed, having nothing to hold against you. Jesus could say to an angry mob, Which of you convicts me of sin? In John chapter 8, verse 46. So having nothing evil to say. The clause means having nothing evil to report concerning us, not, as the English versions, having no evil thing to say. Verse 9 and 10. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So Titus was to teach bond servants about their specific duties as Christians. In the ancient world, Christians shocked the larger culture by mixing slaves and masters in the social setting of the church service. This meant that a slave might go to church and be an elder over his own master. So Paul doesn't say that bond servants should be obedient to every free man, only to their own masters. This means that Paul recognized that bond servants had obligations, but only to their own masters. Obedient. The word obedient was used to describe a company of soldiers as they stand at attention and salute their commander. They are declaring, as they stand at attention in front of him, that they are ready to take his orders. At the same time, 
as in every arena of human submission. Our obedience and submission is limited by our higher responsibility to obey God. As Peter said in Acts chapter 5 verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men when there is no conflict between the two. So not pilfering, this is a type of offense that was so common in the ancient world that sometimes the word servant and thief were used interchangeably. It was assumed that servants would steal from their masters in these small ways. Pilfering, the word signifies not only stealing, but embezzling another person's property, keeping back a part of the price of any commodities sold on the master's account. In Acts chapter 5, verse 2, we translate it to keep back part of the price, the crime of which Ananias and Sapphira were guilty of and struck dead. And simply... Titus must direct servants to be good workers in all ways. By their hard work and humble submission, they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Adorn, it literally means to take precious jewels and arrange them so as to show their true beauty. In one sense, the gospel doesn't need adornment. At the same time, we can show the beauty of the gospel by the way we live. We often think that we need better words to adorn the gospel. Better words are fine, but what we really need are better lives. Wonderfully, those who in this context have the ability to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior are bondservants, slaves under a master. Even one in a low or disadvantaged station in life has the potential to beautify God's truth by the way they live. Verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So grace brings salvation. You don't go out and get salvation. It comes to you and you have the opportunity to receive it. It's a free gift from God that he paid for. And so there is one gospel of grace for all men. God doesn't have a gospel of grace for some and a gospel of law or self-justification for others. All men find salvation by the grace of God. No rank or class or type of mankind is outside the saving influence of God's grace. And there is a beauty and energy in the word epiphiano, or hath shined out, that is rarely noted. It seems to be a metaphor taken from the sun, as by his rising in the east and shining out, he enlightens successfully the whole world. So the Lord Jesus, who is called the Son of Righteousness in Malachi chapter 4 verse 2, arises on the whole human race with healing in his wings. And the light and warmth of the sun is for the whole earth, but it does not shine upon the earth all at the, t- at the same time, nor in the same intensity from place to place. Verse 12 and 13, Teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The ancient Greek word for teaching has in mind what a parent does for a child. It speaks of the entire training process, teaching, encouragement, correction, and discipline. Grace is a teacher in this sense. It teaches us, declares that grace also operates in the lives of the saved, grounded in God's nature. Grace makes ethical demands of Christians consistent with his nature. Teaches, pictures grace, practically personified, as instructing the believer in the things in accord with sound doctrine. And so, thus you see that grace has its own disciples. Are you a disciple of the grace of God? Did you ever come and submit yourself to it? And grace puts ungodliness and worldly lust into our past. Now grace is going to teach us to renounce those things, not just avoid them. Denying is going to indicate the renunciation of the devil, the vanity of this world, and all the sinful lust of the flesh. So one may say that in a world where we are tempted to say yes to every desire and feelings, that the reality of our faith can be demonstrated by what we say no to, by what we are willing to deny. So grace teaches us how to live in the present age. We must live sober, soberly, self-controlled in regard to ourselves. We must live righteously in regard to the people around us. And we must live godly to take God seriously in regard to our God. We are taught by that gentle schoolmistress, the grace of God, to live soberly as regards to our personal life, righteously in relation to others, godly in our attitude towards God. So taken together, we see that the fear of the legalist, that preaching grace produces Christians indifferent to obedience, is unfounded. Grace teaches us obedience. Wherever the grace of God comes effectually, 
It makes the loose liver deny the desires of the flesh. It causes the man who lusted after gold to conquer his greediness. It brings the proud man away from his ambitions. It trains the idler to diligence, and it sobers the wanton mind, which cared only for the frivolities of life. Not only do we leave these lusts, but we deny them. And so the phrase godly in the present age is also subtle proof against the idea of purgatory or some place of cleansing in the life to come. Not supposing that anything will be purified in the world to come that is not cleansed in this. So grace teaches us to expect and prepare for our blessed hope. That hope is not heaven or glory, but Jesus himself face to face closer than ever. Looking for is going to indicate that Christians should live in active expectation of the return of Jesus. It should be precious for Christians to consider that he came the first time to save the soul of man. He will come a second time to resurrect the body. He came the first time to save the individual. He will come a second time to save society. He came the first time to a crucifixion. He will come a second time to a coronation. He came the first time on a tree, the second time on a throne. The first time in humility, the second time in glory. And he came the first time and was judged by men. He will come a second time to judge all men. And he came the first time and stood before Pilate. And he will come a second time and Pilate will stand before him. And so our great God, this is the only place in the New Testament which Megas is applied to the true God. Although it is a constant predicate of the heathen gods and goddesses in Acts 19 verse 28. <clears throat> our great God. And so the discipline of grace, according to the apostle, has three results. Denying, living, and looking. You see the three words before you. Verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So every word of this description of Jesus' work is important. Jesus gave, which means it's voluntary. He gave himself, which means Jesus gave all that he could give. And he gave himself for us, which means that Jesus was given as a substitute for sinful man. So redemption means to be bought out of slavery by the paying of a ransom. We are bought out of our slavery to sin and purchased for his service. So from every lawless deed, and we are therefore taught that the death of Jesus was intended not for our forgiveness and justification merely, but for our sanctification and our deliverance from the power of all of our besetting sins and his own special people. The word we have translated special, periosios, is interesting. It means reserved for. And it was specially used for that part of the spoils of a battle or a campaign which the king who had conquered set apart especially for himself. So we are redeemed and purchased to live with zeal, zealous for good works. This is zeal with knowledge and zeal for righteousness in our own life before a zeal for righteousness in the lives of others. Verse 15, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So Titus and every one of God's messengers of grace are directed to speak, exhort and rebuke and do it with all authority. God's messengers are to remember that they are messengers from a king holding the word that brings back life. It brings life and it turns back hell. And if Titus spoke with all authority, he had to back it up with his life. Titus had to live so that no one would despise him or his message.